Well, folks, what an amazing two days, right? And before we start figuring out what all this means, and it's going to mean a lot, and I think we'll be talking about this conference for a long time to come, I want to take just a minute to tell you about what we think is going to come next or what we're hoping is going to come next. So first, all the posters and the splash talks and resources are still available to you here on the conference website for a short time as we migrate a lot of this content over to the main SIPEP pages where they're gonna to continue to percolate and pollinate our conversations and our discussions in this space. And it's a space that I hope will become a more robust one as a consequence of that. And the recordings of the plenary talks and deeper dives are already available. Thank you, Excel Events, for getting those so quickly around to us. And they're posted on demand. Just go to the agenda tab, Enable show past presentations, pick the ones you want to listen to, and click that big blue view recording button. You can binge watch them all over this weekend. I'm planning on taking them with me to the beach to do just that. <laughs> and I know that many of our speakers are planning publications or thought pieces from the work they presented here, so watch for them. And if this suggested or stimulated you to write or suggest something of your own or publish something of your own, please let us know. We would be delighted to be the uh, sparking point for any of your conversations and publications. We will be producing and uh, preparing and producing a summary report of the conference after we digest all the things that we uncovered while we're getting ready for this conference and in spending the last two days with you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conference, this is for the Department of Energy, a basic research needs conference. And so our desire today was to create the big questions we need to answer, the basic research needs we need to move forward uh, in public engagement and basic research. Now, Brooke, what would you like to add before we begin to take our first sort of deep dive into mm -hmm. what we think might have happened in the brainstorming sessions? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Oh, I would like to add so much. I know that we are in the final end of the push here and people have just been such troopers sticking with this. So just a few high level thoughts as we move into the look at what you talked about in the breakout sessions. Mm -hmm. I was just reflecting on the fact that this partnership between Cavley and DOE officially started in December of 2020. We signed our MOU, our leadership did, uh, right before the holiday season in December of last year. That was six months ago. And so in this six month time period, we moved really quickly to pull this conference together and all of the work we did to even think about what should be in this conference. And I had this moment today of, wow, we did that really fast and it's been really rich. And I'm excited now as we move forward, as we learned from our great discussions the past couple of days that we'll be moving at the speed of trust from here on out. And that's really exciting too, uh, with lots of great areas to move forward with. Uh, I just wanna take a minute before we dive into some of the specifics, especially as we think about the fact that this all did come together in a six month period. The reason that happened is because there's such an amazing team of people working on this conference and even thinking about this. We thanked a lot of them at the beginning of the conference. I have to thank them again. So first of all, we have our SIPEP team, um, the Cavalry and DOE folks. Uh, you can see a picture of all of them on the SIPEP website and links to our bios. Um, but I want to give an enormous shout out to Keegan Sawyer, who joined our team. Uh, we're borrowing her from the National Academies uh, and joined our team at the end of the year when this all started. And she is why we were able to do this so well and so quickly. And with the support, of course, of Natalie Soldan, uh, Katie McKissick, Lauren Budenholzer, Melina Fuentes, all folks that were part of the Cavalier and DOE team. I feel like this is the Oscars and I'm forgetting someone and I'm sorry if I forgot someone because there are so many really important people. Um, and Erica Shugart, who is sitting here with us, joined us from the very beginning as the chair of our steering committee. And in addition to helping uh, bring the steering committee's thoughts to us, she has sat in and been part of every SIPEP leadership team discussion we have had over the past six months. It is a huge time commitment and we could not have done it without her. Thank you to Erica and thank you to all of our steering committee members who I know Erica will also thank again too because we couldn't do it without, without them. And then of course, thanks to everyone who's participated, the speakers, the moderators, the panelists, the folks who have submitted posters and talked with us about their posters during the poster session. There was just so much remarkable 
participation and ideas that came forward. And for all of you who joined, the active chat throughout the entire conference and the Twitter stream and the networking opportunities we all have had it has just been so rich. And we could not have come up with these ideas and where we're about to move without you all being part of it. Uh, before we move into those ideas, I wanna just turn it over to Erica to share some thanks and reflections as well um, as we move to close. Erica? Thanks, Brooke. Well, first I wanna start with um, talking a little bit about the leaderboard. So there were a lot of you who did a lot of activities over the past two days. And the leaderboard captured most of that, but there were a little bit of a hiccups and it didn't quite capture all of it. So we were hoping that we might have some winners there, but in fact, everybody's a winner because not only did you get a lot of great content, but this is my kind of Oprah moment, if you all know Oprah, she's a talk show host here in the United States and she once got to give away cars to her entire audience. I unfortunately am not going to be giving all of you cars, but what we do have is an absolutely amazing gift, which is a recipe book full of appetizers and other recipes that were contributed by the leadership team and the steering committee. I just saw the preview copy of it. And there are some truly tasty treats in there, including chocolate cake with the secret ingredient of sauerkraut, contributed by Rick, and hibiscus kiss champagne cocktail by Brooke. So that will be something. So, so stay tuned, look in your emails for a link to the recipe book. And I know you're going to enjoy those tasty treats. I sure am. It's making me very hungry. I would also like to do another special thanks to the steering committee. You can see them all on the website and you may, they, they were in all the different sessions. They moderated for us. They facilitated brainstorms. They helped at be a raconteur. They of course contributed all their intellectual capital to making this meeting happen. And they really gave a lot of their time. And we we're really, really thankful for all of the work that they put in to make this possible in their perspectives. Because I think that they really, there were a number of moments where they really checked us and made sure that we weren't making assumptions or going forward in ways that wouldn't be beneficial for the community. And I think their contribution is really what, what made, I think, this, this um, conference so very strong. And we really mm -hmm. thank them for their help. I would also like to thank DOE and the Kavli Foundation for their sponsorship of this. This is a novel partnership that really has not been done before. And it's made not only this conference, but also the larger SIPEP program possible. And it's because they share a common interest in ensuring that basic science engagement is supported, sustainable, and effective. And this ongoing support for SIPEP over the next five years will be really significant. There's so many conferences I've been to that are kind of one and done, where you get in and you have some great discussions and you think, boy, I really wanna see some change. I really wanna see something come out of it. This conference is going to be that way. Because as, as was mentioned earlier, this is the first six months of this longer initiative. And I very much appreciate the support that's going to make it possible because I think it's really going to be a change for the public engagement community in a way that we have not seen before. Erica, may I interrupt you for one quick second? <laughs> Sorry. One more important thanks before you move on to some of the substance of the conversation. I know many of us um, here on the screen, all of us here on the screen, but a lot of you have commented on this. What an amazing conference experience this has been. And there is a great team of folks behind this at Corinthian Events who helped us make this happen. And on the Cavley team, um, Elaine Bowie, who is our meetings and events um, manager, has helped to help DOE and Cavley connect with Corinthian events to make this such a great experience. This has been an amazing platform, seamless production, so grateful for great closed captioning, real-time recording, and so much more. So thank you so much to all of you who have made this conference platform and logistics possible. Without a thank doubt. Without a doubt. And I would just like to do a special thanks to Brooke and Rick, who have been our the leaders of this effort is really their vision that has made this possible. And um, I was honored to be asked to be part of it. It was a real privilege for me to be able to just get to hear their ideas and participate in the discussions. So my sincere thanks to them. And now we're gonna switch over to talk about the brainstorm. So thanks to everybody who is here at the end of the conference has stayed with us right here and contributed in the brainstorm sessions. There is a lot of good thinking. And while all of you were enjoying the science comedians, the three of us were busy looking at all of the write-ups that you did. And 
there is so much there. It's going to take a long, a lot more to unpack than the last 30 minutes. But we're just going to talk a little bit about our high level analysis of what we saw there. So each of us took some some of the different brainstorm sessions. And I'm, we're going to start with number five, start, start with a number five in the what we called equity. But I think it's been highlighted throughout that maybe that that term is not the term that we want to be using. So I think the central question is really how do we center justice in what we do and what we ask? And this group came up with several really compelling questions. The first that they talked about was how does the community understand diversity, justice, equity, and inclusion? Um, how do we think about it as a community? How do we think about empowerment and how do we think about the purpose of PE? And I think really, you know, we need to look in, inside our community and understand ourselves, how we're ex um, exploring that. And it really made me reflect about what I heard in a session yesterday in the PR session from Catherine McCormis, who, who mentioned that parachuting in has left a lot of messy campgrounds. You know, we need to reflect on how our work has impacted those communities and how we're understanding it. The next question that really came out of that group is around how do we identify the obstacles and gatekeepers to, ach to achieving a more just democratized future in public engagement in science? So what, what do we need to unpack so that we can overcome these? And when I was in the deference to science section, 3C today that I helped to moderate, I think that was something that for me, I hadn't really thought about deference to science and how important that is in these kinds of discussions. So I think there's a lot there that I'm learning, but I hope that you are as well. And I think that we really need to examine the obstacles that are obvious and those that are not obvious and how we can unpack them. And then next was a, a, an area that came up and it came up kind of in a comment on the side, but I think is really important is understanding that a lot of what academia does is relationships that are transactional. We're, we're getting things from each other. Um, but really a lot of the work that we need to do and working with communities is relational. So think about how effective is relational organizing to impact broader engagement with ac academia, which is transactional. And what is the impact of relational organizing on the organizers and the audiences? Um, and I really, really find this to be um, quite profound. And I think that it came out time and time again with that quote that I've heard more than once in this um, conference was that time, you know, the, the need for time, the fact that we need to proceed at the pace of trust. And I think also a lot of the comments that are, we're in around empathy. I think we train a lot in the science communication field around listening. And that is certainly a skill that's important. But empathy is a whole different skill. And it's one that clearly needs to be learned and embraced by our community. So amazing work there. And there's a lot more to unpack in that, that session that we will need to dig into. But now I'm gonna pivot over to the Brainstorm 4 group, which was looking at metrics. So in metrics, I really saw, you know, a couple of different threads there that they were talking about. And one is just a really super basic question, but really important, which is what do we consider impact? And I think we need to look at that and think about it from an individual level, as well as a collective level. There were a lot of different angles that we can think about in terms of impact. And once we sort of think about what the impact is that we intend and what the impact is that we achieve, how do we measure it? it are we gonna find that every all the different forms of communications are equal? I assume not. But I think that really thinking about how we measure impact, how we identify it, how we know that it's achieved, is going to be quite important. And then there was another whole series of questions about evaluation. The, the group asked, should evaluations be short-term or long-term or both? How do we reconcile top-down with bottom-up kind of work in evaluation? Should evaluation be centralized or decentralized? I, I think it's not, it's all, it's none and all of those things. It is about how do we do all of those things? I think we can probably all agree that most of the work that's done in this area is under evaluated and assessed. So whether you know it's short term or long term, whether it's bottom up or top down, whether it's centralized or decentralized, it's, we need to work on all of those things and think about how can we really bake in evaluation in a way that becomes much more rigorous so that we can learn and improve and not continue to re-evaluate, reinvent, excuse me, 
the wheel. I'd now like to turn it over to Rick, who's going to talk about a couple of our more brainstorming sessions. Thanks, Erica, and, and amen to that. I don't want to have another conference in five years where we start off with, gee, why aren't we doing better evaluation? Gee, why aren't we doing more assessment? Because, you know, for those of you who have a longer memory, there was a conference 20 years ago called Communicating the Future, where we looked at a broader range of science communication, not just public engagement and basic science. And the fundamental question we had there was, or the fundamental recommendation was, more evaluation, better evaluation, got to do this better. And we're saying it again 20 years later. We don't, don't, don't make me say it again. We need better evaluation. Um, and I also want to thank everybody for hanging around uh, for these brainstorming sessions. I know it was, it was hard to you know, spend, I was exhausted at the end of yesterday, and I was even more exhausted at the end of, uh, of most of today. And to hang around for these brainstorming sessions, which really required you to sort of pick up the pace and begin synthesizing these things is, was really hard, and I really appreciate you doing that. I'm going to synthesize some material from groups one and two. And, and I just want to sort of remind people, looking for big questions that we can productively address through the remit of SIPEP, which you know goes on for another four years, four in some four years and some time. And we had some very good recommendations from these groups that sort of help us understand where we might be going with SIPEP and what we might be able to productively address. So for group one, which was focused on sustaining goodwill, the, the very first question right out of the box was spot on. And we've made the assumption, and, and I said it, I think, in the uh, opening remarks, that there's this reservoir of goodwill for basic science, that people like and trust basic science, that the Congress votes for it all the time, the White House supports it. But clearly, this remains an untested hypothesis. And that's especially true given that many people may hear or interpret basic science very differently depending on where in that socio-scientific landscape we've been talking about they hail from. And so it's important for us to understand, first of all, a, what people are thinking about in terms of basic science, and I'll get to that for a second, uh, but also what, what that reservoir is. Is there that reservoir that's there? So after we figure out what basic science is, and, and there's a good sort of a discussion and debate, I think we need to figure out about that that I'll get to in, in the second group, we need to figure out what goodwill amounts to. And is using funding for basic science a reliable proxy for that public support and goodwill? That's what we often turn to. Oh, you know, they'll, they'll fund basic science even when they won't fund climate change. They'll fund basic science even when they won't fund vaccines. Or is this a situation simply where goodwill plus $5 gets you a latte at Starbucks? And that's quite possible. We don't know the answer to that. We really need to figure out just how far goodwill gets you. Does it exist? What does it amount to? And how does it help you uh, move forward? And one of the interesting sort of corollaries there in that conversation was would a hyper-local approach to outreach be more likely to nurture and sustain goodwill uh, or understanding about basic science than our sort of mass-mediated approach that many of us uh, often use? And lastly, how much does the public need to actively understand about science in order to be supportive, to, to, to lend their goodwill, to give us their goodwill? And is trust a critical component of whatever we end up identifying as goodwill? All of these are important and useful um, and critical uh, research questions for how to sustain goodwill, whatever we end up thinking that is. Group two's remit was charged to figure out what whether what what is it about basic science that is unique from an engagement perspective uh, that might color how we proceed uh, with SIPEP and as a science communication and science engagement community? And again, the very first critical question foreshadowed in group one was whether that divide between basic and applied science is cognitively or effectively useful for us. We really need to figure this out. Um, I think that you know, I was telling Brooke earlier that, you know, six months ago when we started, when the ink was just drying on a memorandum of understanding, I think we both thought that there were some interesting things about basic science that were completely different from everything else. And I have to go back, thanks to all of you, I have to go back and rethink what, we're, what we believe about that. Is this how the broader public thinks about science? And if that's not how the broader public thinks about science, 
why are we trying to make them think in a different way uh, when in fact we could probably match more effectively what they already think and, and, and uh, figure that out that way. Corollaries to that basic question, I think, include whether this sort of strict focus on basic science, and I, here I mean to the exclusion of discussions about relevance or news you can use or science you can use, removes us even farther from the publics that we want to engage. And I, I keep going back to thinking, you know, back to the, the equity question, you know, basic science is not only is the most basic of everything, it's also the very top of that ivory tower. And you're farther and farther and farther removed from the public at the top of that tower. And is our communication about that top of the ivory tower farther and farther and farther removed from the public? Or conversely, is this field of basic science or our concept of it so usefully broad so more members of the public actively see themselves engaged by it or, or attending to it or participating in it? And one of the quotes that came out of the conversation that I'm going to carry with me is you don't have to be an expert to ask a basic science question. I like that. I'm going to carry forward with that. And that's going to go on my on my email signature block, I think, for a while now. Brooke, I think uh, it's up to you to share some uh, mm -hmm. high level questions. Yep. I've got the final group focused on training. I'm also very much enjoying the chat and the design of all the SIPEP swag that's going on. We look forward to following up on that too. Uh, okay, the training group, which I believe was group three. Uh, a lot of great fodder that we saw in your notes and the questions there. Um, and a couple of things that uh, I noticed too is some of the questions that came forward are really evergreen questions for all of science training. And it's really important that this group is having those conversations. And also some questions specific to basic science. And I really like that both of those kinds of questions came forward. Uh, so one of the top questions, which is of course, one of the big themes of this conference and the big questions we'll be moving forward is how to center justice and equity in the science communication trainings that we do. Um, I did want to uh, acknowledge there is actually John Besley who was here. Um, I don't know if he's still here with us. And Anthony Dudo did a landscape analysis of communication trainers um, probably two or three years ago now. And that was one of the things that they um, pointed out as one of their analysis in terms of what's the training community doing, not doing, where are they, um, where are their stumbling blocks? And one of the top things that they noted after um, an analysis of interviews with lots of different trainers is trainings are not diverse. Um, who is doing the training uh, is not diverse. Who people are um, training to connect with is not an inclusive and equitable view of the world. Um, and the different modes and methods we're using to, and skills that we're bringing to folks uh, lacks a sense of diversity and inclusion. There's actually uh, a group, the Science Communication Trainer Network. Uh, I encourage you to look if you, if you are a trainer, and I think there are many of you here and you're not part of that, connect with that group because they started working together as trainers across the whole field on this question. Um, and there's so much work to be done and we need more voices, more experiences as part of that. So I encourage you to go look at that group. But uh, that question really rose to the top. Um, there was another question too about how we make sure that training is applicable for the types of communication and engagement that people want to do. Uh, and this, this resonates with me when I read that too, in terms of oftentimes people getting training because it's what's available to them or it's who they know, but have they thought deeply about what they wanna do with their communication and engagement and how can they um, match that with the kinds of training that they're doing? Uh, and uh, I have two more questions. I think we were supposed to do three, but there were four that I picked. Um, another is how do we make sure training is appropriate for where you are on your career trajectory and where your career path is headed? And so that's an interesting one that I haven't heard before um, that we should probably give a little bit more thought to as well. And lastly, um, one very specific to basic science. Uh, the question is, is the predominant mode of trainers uh, focused on helping the researchers make their science applied, making it relevant? And are there basic skills or building blocks for science communication that might be foundational for all of science communication? And are there unique ones for basic scientists who maybe aren't looking for making their science 
relevant to some future application. Um, this one really, really spoke to me. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of experience in my career in doing communication training with scientists and helping develop trainings. And I had uh, a very powerful experience when working with a room full of applied scientists that had a single basic scientist in the room. Uh, and we were going through an exercise of talking about why your science matters and what does that mean to you? And the basic scientist said to me, it matters because it's basic science. And we really tried to unpack that. How do you talk about the public? To, how do you talk with the public about that? What does that mean? And it was just, it felt like it was on a very different playing field to the other 25 scientists in the room who were able to say, oh, it helps in your life tomorrow because of this very specific thing that you can relate to. And that's really, that's, that's, that's stuck with me. And I see that in this question. And I think that that's something that would be really great to unpack more um, as we move forward with SciPEP, especially as so many scientists are looking for these skills and training. Um, and just really quickly, the, that group also talked about resources that might exist um, or importantly might not. Uh, there's a list of some resources that we'll share in our follow-up, but I did want to call attention to one thing that was flagged, highlighted, bolded, underlined, is um, a lack of a resource, which is there's just not enough funding for science communication training. Um, it seems to be some sort of public good and service that is um, provided, yet experts provide it, we don't have enough um, professionals, social science scholars involved, and until we pay for it, are we really going to be um, doing it as well as we should be? So I just wanted to give a shout out to that, I think very important point. So I think that that is it for the five sessions and the wrap up. As Rick said, there's a lot of different kinds of summaries that will come forward. We'll have a report of this workshop. We're gonna dig more into the great discussions you all have. Um, we'll We'll look to the SciPEP website to post some of these things. Uh, but I know that we have all been working so hard. And those of you that are here to the very end, thank you for being so devoted and so committed to these conversations the last two days. I think we all deserve um, a real walk on the beach or a park or near a bench, not a virtual one. And so with that, we'll um, go around the screen here. But uh, Time to sign off. And again, huge gratitude for all of you. My colleagues on the screen, Erica and Rick, thank you for this amazing journey, the whole SciPEP team. And we look forward to what's next. Erica? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you to all the folks on the screen, but a special thank you to all of you out there. I was amazed when I did the demographics graphics yesterday and mm -hmm. I saw that there were 85 countries represented. You know, it's been an unusual and difficult mm -hmm. year. And it's really hard to do things virtually. But one of the advantages of doing things virtually is that we get so many more people involved. And I just really appreciate the folks that stuck it out, whether you're at 2 a.m. in the morning or 6 a.m., uh, because having this community be so much larger than it often is when we're in a room together has been really special for me. And um, just wanted to thank you for coming and showing up and thinking with us. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Erica. It's been an, an absolute pleasure working with both of you and, of course, with the rest of the team, but you guys are just terrific, and we could not have had this conference uh, uh, both without your brain power and, uh, and, and your constant engagement uh, over this. I think, for all that, we deserve a hibiscus kiss, and I'm going <laughs> to right out of that book. <laughs> now, we promise, and I, I think I can make this promise on behalf of all of us, we're going to be even more thoughtful and insightful than we have been in the last half hour as we digest all of your hard work. That was our first, uh, first take on this, but a lot of stuff is going to come out of this. All thanks to you. Thank you all so much. Don't be strangers. Let's make this a continuing and robust engagement. Thanks again. <laughs>